Knights were the most feared warriors on the medieval battlefield. They were highly trained, well armored, and with their trusty steed faster than any mere foot soldier. Knights were at the top of the medieval social ladder and the subject of countless romances and fairy tales. But where did the knight come from, and what did a young man have to do to become one? The first individuals we could reasonably call knights were the mounted warriors hired by Charlemagne, the king of the Franks in the 8th century. These fighters were so important to Charlemagne's conquests that the knights were given large tracts of land for their service. This system of skilled warriors swearing fealty to a king or lord in return for land, and later titles, was the origin of feudalism the dominant political system of the European Middle Ages. Once the feudal system was cemented, becoming a knight developed into a hereditary occupation. Not just anyone could become a knight. While there were some rare cases of commoners being knighted, most knights had to be born into nobility. This was mainly because a knight had to acquire his own armor, weapons, and horses. Only the nobility could afford such things. A young boy destined for knighthood would spend the first seven years of his life in the care of his family, taught basic etiquette from his mother and other female family members. At the age of seven, he would be turned over to a local lord to become a page. A page was essentially a servant to a knight, lord, or nobleman. Think of the young boy in the classic Christmas carol, Old King Wenceslas. Along with his responsibilities as a servant, the page would learn to hunt, take care of horses, and in some cases learn to read and write from the local chaplain. When he got older, he may have even been trained in the basics of horse riding and swordsmanship, though only using wooden swords. At the age of 14, a page would graduate to a squire. A squire was essentially a knight in training. Not relegated to doing menial tasks around the castle anymore, the squire's main responsibility was to carry and care for the armor and weapons of a knight, as well as accompany a knight to battle, carrying the knight's supplies and his banner. Think of young Arthur from the Sword in the Stone, who at the time was a squire for Sir Kay. The squire continued his training from his time as a page, but would use real weapons and wear his own armor. They developed certain skills that all knights were expected to be proficient at. These included riding, swimming, shooting, jousting, wrestling, fencing, and even dancing. Finally, at the age of 21, a squire was eligible to become a knight. The young man would be knighted in a ceremony called an accolade. The ceremony would usually take place during a seasonal festival like Christmas or Easter, or even a wedding. The squire would have a ritual bath the night before, followed by a night of prayer. On the day of the ceremony, a squire would swear fealty to the lord or king, and the king would knight the squire by touching him on the shoulders with a sword, a practice most of us are probably familiar with. A knight's main responsibility was, of course, on the battlefield. They were obligated to fight in the military campaigns of their lords and show bravery, professionalism, and chivalry. Chivalry is a complicated topic and deserves a video of its own, but basically chivalry was a code of conduct that knights followed on and off the battlefield. In the modern day, we think of chivalrous behavior as a way for men to act honorably towards women. And while that was part of medieval chivalry, it was only a fraction of what the code meant. But again, the whole subject is for another time. Lastly, during peacetime, knights were expected to take part in tournaments. Tournaments were designed to display a knight's skill as well as entertain the people of the court. The knights would ride around the castle grounds, parading their armor, heraldry, and banner, before taking part in the military games. The events in the tournament were called Hastaludes. There were many such competitions, but here are three common ones. The melee, 
which was a free-for-all duel between a large number of knights, whether on horseback or off. A tupinere was a one-on-one -on -one duel, where clean hits to certain parts of the body would score points. And of course, there was the joust. The joust is the most well-known and most romanticized of the sports. It was fought between two individuals on horseback holding lances. The competitors would line up across from one another, then charge each other, hoping to knock the opponent off his horse using his lance. In the late Middle Ages, the joust became the main event in the tournament. When a knight died, whether on the battlefield or off of it, they were given an honored burial. It was part of a squire's responsibility to ensure the knight he served was buried correctly. If the knight was part of a chivalric order, a sort of knight club, which again deserves its own video, they would likely be buried in the order's special cemetery. It was not uncommon, in fact, for knights to join an order at an old age as to ensure a decent resting place. It was also common for knights, especially very rich or very respected knights, to have an effigy on their grave, a stone carving of them, usually in their full armor. So that's all we have for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it a like, watch some of our other videos, and if you want, subscribe to help build the channel. Bye!